Fritz Frog attacks SSH servers worldwide, the Weather Channel application data privacy finally comes to a settlement, and nationwide biometric data privacy? Hmm, maybe it'll be a thing. All that coming up now on ThreatWire. Greetings, I am Shannon Morris, and this is ThreatWire for August 25th, 2020. This is your summary of the threats to our security, privacy, and internet freedom. I have a surprise announcement. This was kind of a surprise for me too. Patreon just introduced annual memberships, so I immediately enabled that on the ThreatWire account, so you can now support ThreatWire annually or monthly. For a limited time, annual supporters will also get a 15% off discount Account, which amounts to about two months of free access, and you will still get the same perks. Current patrons can also switch to take advantage of that discount. It's very exciting. And now onto the news. If you use a secure shell or SSH server for managing a network of machines in your place of work or at home, listen up because there is a covert botnet that was recently discovered that is targeting these kinds of devices. Gardacore Labs researchers reported on Wednesday that they had discovered an undisclosed botnet that was completely written from scratch that appears to target SSH servers to infect and turn them into a peer-to-peer -peer network. This would allow an attacker to use each infected device to distribute their code to other devices for infection instead of using a centralized server for hosting, hence the name botnet. Gardacore Labs dubbed this botnet Fritzfrog. Now they have noted that Fritz Frog has been continually updated with 20 plus versions since January, and it has in memory payloads that never hit the disk drives, meaning that it is fileless. It can also backdoor infected machines, and it targets SSH servers, and it uses a table of login credentials to find low hanging fruit like weak password usage. They created a program called Frogger that can exchange encryption keys with the actual botnet so they could infiltrate the P2P traffic happening between infected machines, which allowed them to track what was going on. Now, since botnets do not rely on a centralized command server, it is harder to submit takedowns and also harder to detect. Fritzfrog appears to be targeting IP addresses in the millions belonging to financial institutions, telecoms, universities, and government agencies. Gardacore Labs reports that 500 servers have in fact been infected and 13,000 attacks have been performed hitting several different countries. According to their report, the payload installs and executes 30 different commands. The attacker can send commands over SSH to a Netcat client on the infected machine, and it downloads logs and files and evades detection and protections such as firewalls. Fritzfrog installs a public encryption key on the infected server, so if it gets rebooted or the password gets changed, it still has a backdoor into the server. It evades detection by running as ifconfig or nginx, then listens on port 1234 for commands to sync with the botnet. Fritzfrog was written in the open source programming language called Golang, and it does share some resemblances to another P2P botnet called Rakos. Admins and managers should set up strong passwords and public key authentication on their SSH servers to protect against infection, change the SSH port, or just disable SSH access altogether if you are not using it. If worried about being infected with this botnet, Gardacore Labs has compiled a free open source repo on GitHub that can run a detection script and also contains indicators of compromise for the campaign. The entire report is super interesting to read. I read the whole thing. And all the resources are linked in the description down below. Well over a year ago, the Weather Channel app, which is owned by IBM, was hit with a lawsuit for their alleged collection and use of user data such as precise location. With over 45 million users monthly, it would affect many users as, quote, the world's most downloaded weather app. Had the collection been upfront, they probably wouldn't be hit with this lawsuit, but the city of Los Angeles stated that they misled and misinformed consumers about how the location data was utilized, not telling users that this data was allowing the Weather Channel app to profit off of its collection. 
At the time, IBM refuted the claims, calling them baseless and saying that they would, quote, defend their disclosures vigorously. Now, last week, IBM came to a settlement with the Los Angeles City Attorney's Office in regards to this lawsuit. The Weather Channel still argued that information was properly disclosed to users via the online privacy policy, but the settlement still has IBM agreeing to revise the data privacy disclosures. The new disclosure will come in the form of a permission prompt presented to users when enabling location tracking. So it doesn't sound like that was very baseless after all. IBM also agreed to donate technology to the city and county to help deal with COVID-19 relief and contact tracing efforts. In the final settlement, it was found that the Weather Channel did disclose their handling of data, but the lawsuit argued that most users don't sit and read all of that fine print, so it should be presented in, it in a user-friendly way. Now, while they agreed to change how they disclose this location data sharing and sales, this also means that they are continuing to share this data with advertisers. They're now just being more upfront about it. So while it may be a win for disclosure practices, it is not a win for location data sales practices, which is still very privacy invasive. Before we hit story number three, I wanted to say thank you so much to my supporters over at patreon.com slash threatwire. You know the deal. Check out these amazing new fur babies from my hush puppy perk level patrons who are totally awesome for sending them in. I love them. Keep them coming. They're so cute. Also, if you have not seen the action alerts that I have been posting on the page, I've gotten really great feedback back from several different patrons who said that they have used the alerts to harden their own network security or the business that they work at. That's amazing news and is exactly what I was trying to do with these action alerts. So you can see all of the alerts on the Patreon page by searching for action alerts. Big thanks to my patrons for voting for this top story to be included in today's episode. A new bill is making its way through the U.S. Senate that could increase the restrictions that companies would have to adhere to if using facial recognition technology. This would make some of the statewide restrictions that we've seen surfacing in states such as Illinois become nationwide legislation, and it would require all states to abide by the same policy. This bill is called the National Biometric Information Privacy Act, and it was introduced by Democratic Senators Jeff Merkley of Oregon and Bernie Sanders of Vermont. TLDR it basically takes what we have seen in Illinois' Biometric Information Privacy Act and makes it nationwide. So that includes two very important parts. One is being that companies would be limited in how biometric data is collected, and two, it would also give people the right to take action in court if a company fails to adhere to policy. State attorneys general would also be able to sue companies if they violate privacy or policies, and it would require written consent from anyone before biometric data could be collected. The written consent would have to be explicit and clear, and not bundled with any kind of terms of service or contract. Since this is about biometric data and not just facial recognition, that means that it includes retina and iris scans, voice prints, face prints, including photographs, fingerprints and palm prints, and the very broad, quote, any other uniquely identifying information based on the characteristics of an individual's gait or other immutable characteristic of an individual. So lots of things. This would be a powerful move against the use and collection of biometric data, as the Illinois law has already been used in several court cases to sue companies. By fighting this early and ensuring that it does not become the norm in neighborhoods, businesses, and public places, it can help keep society from becoming conditioned to the idea that biometric collection is acceptable without your consent. Holding companies and law enforcement accountable early can send a message to other agencies who deem this data collection to be valid without that consent. Before I leave, I want to say thank you to Ricardo M, Joseph A, Sean T, Ivan, Tiki, Kevin S, Boba Fett 2010, Dane L, Sweetina L, Brian M, Flame Sniper, Tech Dad, Henrik W, Call Me PH, Bob C, Ryan P, Larkin R, Gage B, GK, and Robert H 
whew, who joined the Patreon team this week. I feel like everybody wanted annual memberships. So thank you so much because each and every one of you are awesome. I apologize for the background noise this week. There's a construction truck outside and my cat decided to join me in the studio today but hopefully you can forgive me. And with that, do not forget to like and subscribe. I am Shannon Morris, and I will see you on the internet.